Guten Abend, es freut mich wieder in Berlin zu sein. Ich habe vor 28 Jahren hier ein Jahr gewohnt. Ich habe ein Zimmer in Schöneberg gemietet, 100 Mark im Monat bezahlt, glaube ich. Hatte eine Treppenklo und seitdem ist die Stadt, äh, hat sich die Stadt sehr geändert, wie ich heute wieder gesehen habe. Und Berlin ist momentan auch auf dem Weg, äh, London zu ersetzen als kulturelle Hauptstadt Europas. Aber jetzt werde ich auf Englisch weitergehen, damit Sie mich auch besser verstehen können. Well, as you just heard, I'm a citizen of nowhere, as Theresa May, our Prime Minister, would say. And today we're talking about another of my former countries, one to which I used to be very attached, the United States. As you've also heard, I grew up in the Netherlands. But when I was 10 years old, we moved to Palo Alto, California, because my father, who's an academic, was doing a one-year sabbatical there. So we moved to what was then a very typical American campus town, Palo Alto. And it was really quite affordable in those days, which looking back is bizarre. The, I just looked up the median house price in Palo Alto in 1980, $148,900, which even taking into account of inflation wasn't so bad. So we arrived there, the sun is shining all the time, and it was frankly nicer than Europe. Uh, the people were a bit richer, but above all they were cheerier, and they had this sense of they could do anything. They were better educated because in those days, California had a very affordable system of state universities. And Americans had this idea which struck me as someone who'd grown up in Europe as very strange. They thought you could always reinvent yourself. If there was something you didn't like about your life, you could just change it. So you could move 3,000 kilometers. You could change your religion. You could suddenly get rich. You could change your spouse which now we all think of as normal, but I think in 1980 in Europe, as a child, I hardly knew anyone who was divorced. I didn't even know this really existed. And then in California, half the adults we met were divorced. They just done it. So this idea that you can change your life extended even to houses. One of my strongest memories of that year was there was this truck driving down the street with a trailer, and on the trailer was a house. So somebody had taken a house put it on a trailer and was moving it to a better location. So in California in 1980, even houses were upwardly mobile. Everything was possible. My school, Addison Elementary, was on a street called Addison Avenue. And on that street in 1939, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard had founded in a garage of their house, they both lived in the same house, a computer company called Hewlett Packard, which was seen as the birthplace of Silicon Valley. So it was a lovely time, fun, energetic, sunny, and I kind of became an Americophile, an instinctive pro-American. Later I went back to the US to study there, and as you heard, maybe inevitably, I married an American. But looking back, what I was seeing in Palo Alto then was the dying days of the American dream, the last days of this belief that Americans had, that in the US, anyone from anywhere could become anything. And it's time to bury that dream, the American dream, and replace it instead with something that works much better, which is the European dream. We haven't named it because in Europe we don't have a public media sphere, but the European dream is really has helped make this into the world's happiest region. Back to the American dream, what is it? If you ask Americans to define it, it has as much to do with family, and with faith as it does with economic rise, but economic rise has always been an essential component of the American dream. The rags to riches ideal was probably first formulated by Horatio Alger in his 19th century novels. And the basic idea is that if you really want something and you work hard and you read self-help books, you can do it, you can be anything. And in the decades after 1945, the American dream really did come within reach of white men at least. The government subsidized white men to study, think of the GI Bill for example, and it subsidized them to buy homes. And I think in its origins, the American dream was only ever really meant for white men. The dream was fundamentally materialist. It created overwrought expectations, and inevitably it produced losers. So highbrow American fiction always critiqued the American dream. The writers never liked it. 
And the broken dream was embodied by this stock character of post-war American fiction, which is the former star high school athlete. So think of Tennessee Williams, Marlon Brando playing the um, boxer in Streetcar Named Desire, the former boxer who's fallen on hard times, and in On the Waterfront, also in Williams' Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Think of Rabbit from John Updike's uh, Rabbit Angstrom from Updike's Rabbit novels. And Biff Lohman, the son of Willie in uh, Death of a Salesman. These are all former high school athletes. Their lives have gone nowhere. They are the broken dream. And even in the boom years, the broken dream was very common in real life. And I see it in my wife's family. My wife grew up in Miami, where her father ran a small and failing advertising agency. And around him, he saw his contemporaries living the dream. They sold real estate. They started banks. They built waterfront mansions on Miami Beach, because you know that in America, success is much bigger than success over here. And my father-in-law just never could make it. And one day, sitting in his mid-market Toyota car, beneath the mango trees of their suburban home, with a small swimming pool in the back, so a kind of life that all of us in Europe would have signed up for at once. We'd have said, this is the dream, man. You're living it. But he said to his daughter, my future wife, I just don't know how to make money. And he felt, to use Donald Trump's quintessentially American word, he felt like a loser. He hadn't lived the dream. And during my year in Palo Alto, America changed because that November, Ronald Reagan was elected president. And in the decades since, the economy has mostly kept growing. But as you know, the gains have gone very much to a few people living in increasingly wealthy enclaves like Palo Alto. So in Palo Alto, now the birthplace of Google, the hub of Silicon Valley, the median home price is nearer two and a half million dollars, up from 150,000 in 1980. So the US has grown, grown wealthier, but at the same time, government spending on education, on schools, on state universities has fallen. And the rich, you know, they don't mind. They have the tax cuts, they have the economic growth, they're happy to pay for private education. And they've captured, to a large degree, the best American universities. The private universities rely very heavily on donations from alumni. So what do you do? How do you encourage donations? You say to the alumni, we'll make it easy for your son or daughter to get in as well. At Ivy League universities, this is more or less official policy to encourage legacies. And in the Harvard freshman class last year, 29% were legacies, which means in American terminology that they come from a family of alumni and therefore of potential donors. The best example is Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who was a very mediocre high school student. But amazingly, his father, a real estate magnate who later went to prison, donated $2.5 million to Harvard. And voila, uh, Jared gets into Harvard. So the rich have bought the system. And so social mobility, which is the premise of the American dream, has collapsed. There's a study by um, Michael Carr and Emily Wiemers of the University of Massachusetts. They use census data to show that an American worker's chances of moving up the income ladder were much less in 1990, 90, 1993 to 2008 than they were in 81 through 96. There's a variety of sociological economic studies showing that the American dream is dying. Uh, Raj Chessy of Harvard led a study in 2014 which shows that fewer than 10% of Americans in the bottom fifth of the income distribution are going to make it to the top fifth. And Joseph Ferry of Northwestern University says social mobility is actually even lower if you factor in grandparents or great-grandparents. What most Americans are doing, he's saying, is tracking their great-grandparents and grandparents' social status. So we've now reached this amazing situation that if you want social mobility, if you want to be anything, come to Scandinavia. Northern Europe does this better than America. So what do you get when you get economic growth for most of the last 80 years since the rearmament boom of World War II? And you get families then with three generations of wealth creation, but very low inheritance taxes. Increasingly, the US cuts inheritance tax. And now you don't have to pay an inheritance at all. You just put your money in a trust 
in Nevada or South Dakota, no inheritance tax to pay for centuries. So what you get is a society of heirs, of people who have inherited their social status. And visiting my in-laws in Miami, I see how this works. Miami is mostly a poor city of recent immigrants with a black underclass, but it's also a place with many of the richest people in the United States. And many of these people have never earned a dollar themselves. They've just inherited it. I know a lovely woman in her 70s whose father, a small businessman, made $100 million, left her $100 million, because in the US, success is big. She's never worked, and her daughter and the daughter's husband don't work either, and their children almost certainly won't work either. I see with the daughter and her husband, who are my generation, that not working is boring and it's unfulfilling, but hey, it's a life. And so what do they do? They spend a lot of time, uh, energy, thinking about how to give money away, chiefly to arts institutions or to politicians. And so this is a society where it's very appropriate that the man at the top, Trump, is himself an heir, pretending to be a self-made man. Trump on television has played the embodiment of the American dream, the businessman who makes it out of nothing. But as we know, the New York Times revealed last month, he inherited at least $413 million from his father. And who is his de facto right-hand man? Kushner, himself an heir. So this is the society that they symbolize. The US works for Trump, it works for Kushner, and it works for liberals, too, in enclaves like Palo Alto, where they rant against Trump, but put their children in private schools and their money in trusts. So they feel good about themselves while benefiting from the system. But for most Americans, the society feels like an experiment in how can you have a wealthy country that creates the maximum amount of misery for the average person. Being an American, and an average American like my father-in-law, is like running a struggling small business. You're always on the brink of going bust. So you have to plan extensively for your own health care, and even then, 42% of Americans who get cancer run through their lifetime savings in the first two years of treatment. So you work nonstop in multiple jobs, and you skimp many of the pleasures of European life. Think of Thanksgiving next week. It's a celebration of family, so you spend a day with your family, maybe a weekend, you have a big meal together. Now this festival would make zero sense in countries like France or Italy, where people do this every weekend, families do this every weekend, but in America it's conceived of as an annual treat. Now most Americans still have some belief in the dream. They overestimate their chances of social mobility, whereas we in Europe underestimate our chances, according to a study led by uh, Alberto Alessina of Harvard this year. And no wonder Americans still have a residual belief in the dream, given that every television ad sells a version of the American dream. But faith in this dream is fading, and you see it in the Republican Party. For decades, the Republicans sold a version of the dream. Just get government off our backs, and we can all make it ourselves. If you just really want to do it, the American individual can make it. But when Trump came down the escalator, the golden escalator at Trump Tower in 2015 to launch his candidacy, he said, sadly, the American dream is dead. And I think he's right. And so it's no wonder that his party has shifted from selling the dream to selling something very different, which is Trumpist nativism, which now sells better. After the election, there was talk of the white working class that voted him into power. Now, why do we speak of the white working class, this very European language of class? It's because these people now see themselves as belonging for their whole lives to a class that they don't expect ever to leave. It's a very European vision of immobility. So no wonder that in many polls, more Democrats and young Americans now say they believe in socialism then say they believe in capitalism. A poll by Gallup this summer, for example, 18 to 29 year olds, 51% said they believed in socialism, only 45% in capitalism. Now, what does socialism mean? I think for most Americans, it means something like universal health care, a welfare state, social protection. In other words, something like the European system. Last year, I interviewed Bernie Sanders, 
And it struck me during the interview that he doesn't see himself at all as a radical revolutionary trying to bring in European ideas into America. No, he sees himself as somebody who represents the American silent majority. He thinks most Americans believe the stuff that I believe, and I think he's right. He told me, if you were to tell Americans that if you're 70 and the doctor diagnoses you with cancer, that there should not be a healthcare program to protect you, 90% of people say, you're out of your mind. Do you want to get rid of Medicare? What are you talking about? You want to get rid of federal aid to education? That's nonsense. In other words, he's saying, most Americans now have a rather American view of economics. Of course, if we get to healthcare and to abortion or guns, their debate is very different from ours. On economics, I would say most of them are where most of us are. So they want a society that looks more like Germany, say, but they have a society that looks more like Brazil or apartheid South Africa. Maybe they should ditch their version of the American dream and try the Western European dream instead. Thank you very much.